So yeah, last uh, last section, noise and glitch. Um, so I don't know if you can really tell. There's kind of this there's kind of this undercurrent to a lot of what I do. It's a um, maybe it's maybe it's my aesthetic. I don't know what you call it, but uh, I'm I'm really interested in um, noisy things, like things that uh, well I don't know. You, can, you guys can probably identify noise. It's like porn, right? You know it when you see it. Maybe you can't define it. But um, <laughs> same thing with glitch. It's also really hard to define glitch. Um, so one of my first, one of my first experiments uh, making something, actually maybe it's something like some of this stuff. I'm not sure. This is a much simpler version, I'm sure. But uh, one of my first experiments kind of exploring, um, exploring noise with electronics was this thing called NAND hopper. I made three of these. They're all for, um, well, the first one I just made for fun, but then this uh, crazy experimental film director from Mexico was like, I need that as the soundtrack to all my movies. <laughs> and he commissioned me to make two more, which I'm totally fine with. So, uh, so I actually don't have these anymore because I sent them all to him. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, so it's like this really simple circuit. And I posted um, an instructable on how to make these also. Um, actually, I'm thinking now that they're probably not like this stuff because I didn't see any digital circuits over there. So, um, but it has this, it has this one um, uh, dip chip called a, a NAND. Um, and the NAND has this, it, the NAND is a logical operation. And it has this really interesting property, which is that you can compose any other logical operation from uh, a collection of NAND operators. Um, and I thought, well, that's kind of nice. Maybe I can make a, uh, a circuit that can make any kind of sound based on a composition of multiple sounds um, you know, using this principle. Since it's all just logic, then theoretically, I don't know, this is kind of what I was thinking. And um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I basically went on this exploration of figuring out different ways to wire these four NAND gates to each other in feedback loops that would make different kinds of sounds. So there's actually three NANDs in this, uh, NAND hoppers in this video. Um, and they each kind of have their own characteristic sound. And then there's four, four sensitive resistors that I made um, sitting off to the side. They're kind of like the legs, and you play the legs of the NAND hopper. Um, so you press them down, and then that kind of influences the sound. Um, uh, let's see. And then I made a, a revision to that. Oh, so yeah. So like I said, I was exploring with um, yeah different ways of combining um, Combining sounds and uh, designing different kinds of circuits for um, doing capac adding capacitive sensing to it instead of just force sensing, and that led me to this one. sounds really funny <laughs> and that's kind of why I like to play with it but I'm also I don't know there's there's something really nice about this idea of like you can synthesize any possible sound based on some combination of these other sounds and if they're in a feedback circuit then I don't know anyway so this this version uh, uses instead of just four sensitive resistors it also has a bunch of LEDs and light sensitive resistors and and uh, there's also this capacitive sensing circuit off to the side so that depending on how I'm uh, 
uh, moving my hands around this breadboard, um, I'm actually indirectly influencing the breadboard even if I'm not touching it. Or I'm indirectly influencing the sound even if I'm not touching it. So there's like three modes of operation I have to be continuously aware of. And I've um, practiced with this uh, for like uh, a few months, like every other day, uh, with some friends that were also making music. And I got this really intuitive feeling for like how I can move my hands around. And it wasn't something I could verbalize at all. But um, I, I was really glad because I made a system that had enough variety that um, I could kind of make expressive sounds, like sounds that I wanted to make. Um, uh, but it wasn't simple enough that the, you heard the same sounds over and over. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, I'm going to be exploring this direction some more soon, but I um, uh, haven't really, had a, <coughs> haven't really had, a, had a chance to come back to um, hardware hacking recently. Like I said, I've been doing a lot of software stuff. So uh, who knows Paolo? Paolo Pettuccini? Okay, great. So this is his, his contribution to another glitch project I was working on. Um, this is when I was thinking about glitches, more like a sort of distortion of things. Um, just, so there's a lot of different ways of thinking of glitch, and distortion is one of them. Distortion of a signal is a kind of glitch. Um, uh, so down here at the bottom right, you can see, yeah, down here at the bottom right, you see this little, um, uh, there's this little card. It's maybe about that big. It's really small. Um, and uh, I basically I took some quotes from my fellow MFA students and the MFA program at RPI, um, and I encoded them uh, phonetically, and then I used those phonemes and I encoded them as colors. So um, sometimes a single phoneme would be multiple colors, depending on whether it was a consonant or, or a vowel. And um, uh, yeah, and so similar phonemes would have uh, similar color codes to each other. And the idea was that I would give these little cards to my friends that gave me the quotes, and they would carry them in their back pockets for the whole summer. And then at the end of the summer, I would try and decode them. And uh, what I got back would be something that was kind of like what they said originally, but it was kind of distorted by the path that was worn on that piece of paper over the period of the summer. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so part of, part of the idea was that it was distorted by this path. Part of the idea was that it was distorted in a phonetically contextual way. So when one phoneme changed, it changed into something that was similar, not something that was completely different. Um, so if you guys have ever seen like uh, um, HDTV glitch, like an incoming HDTV transmission, uh, it can make something that's like really crazy different, like everything, maybe the pixels will all bleed or all the colors will invert or something like that. Whereas with uh, old analog TV transmissions, um, when something glitches, it's like maybe there's a little noise here or there's some ringing artifacts. Um, so in a way, there's kind of uh, the, the analog signal is um, uh, more true to the visual stimulus that we're receiving, whereas the compressed HDTV signal um, is more true to the um, sort of computer's interpretation of, of what the signal is. So I wanted to create an encoding for the for phonemes that was true to our understanding of kind of similar sounds. Um, and yeah, Paula wrote me this great message with it. Hello, Kyle. I'm I, I can't read it. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see another glitch piece. This one's called PPPD. And started right here. This is running like right now, so this is real time. stuff looks the same. Actually, he was someone telling me that. <laughs> he said, I wouldn't know that was made by you. And I told him, well, you'd have to kind of understand what's going on in the background to know why it's made by me. And th the reason is, uh, or the reason you would know that is because uh, it's basically the same principle as what's driving um, the NAND hopper, this idea of uh, an operation that can generate anything. Um, and so PPBD is based on a 
programming language called P prime prime, and there's another version of that programming language called Brainfuck. I don't know, has anyone heard of Brainfuck before? Okay, great. Oh, wow, that's way more than usual. <laughs> um, so Brainfuck is this programming language that's really, really esoteric and difficult to write anything in. Like, if you want to write a program that does something, Brainfuck is absolutely the last programming language you would want to write it in. Um, so I'm using that kind of in the background. The thing that's nice about Brainfuck is that it only has six operators. So normally you have like a whole keyboard. You can type letters, you can type numbers, you can type all these uh, um, you know parentheses, ampersands, commas. Um, but Brainfuck, Brainfuck <laughs> only has six characters, and it's like the you know you basically have two characters for looping. You have a plus and a minus. And uh, which increments and decrements the current position in memory, and um, you have uh, two more operators that move the memory position left and right. Um, and it turns out that this language is what's called Turing complete, which means that anything that you could want to do, you could represent with this language um, potentially. Like, or sorry, theoretically it's possible. Practically, it's really difficult, but theoretically it's possible. Um, so what I'm doing in the background is I'm basically generating programs randomly. I'm generating uh, random brainfuck programs and then running them. And then what you see is the memory space of the program. So as the program runs, it kind of spits out a bunch of stuff. It generates a bunch of things. Um, and sometimes they're repetitive things because it gets caught in a loop. Sometimes they're like a little burst of crazy noise because it basically is emulating a pseudo random number generator without me telling it to. <laughs> uh, and sometimes you just don't see anything because the program fails to go anywhere. Maybe it's in an infinitely small loop or something. Um, uh, so it's the same basic idea, basically that uh, the same way that Nand Hopper could maybe generate any sound, potentially, uh, PPPD could generate any image or any sound as well uh, in a very different way. Um, so that leads me to uh, the last project I'm going to talk about, which is Only Everything Lasts Forever. How many different songs can we distinguish? That's a different question than how many different blips and bloops and what were your words calling? Whoppers? Whoppers? <laughs> how many different woovers and whoppers can we distinguish? Um, uh, so I started like reading psychoacoustics textbooks and um, to try and find an answer to this question. Um, and I realized that there was actually kind of already an implicit answer in our culture, which is the MP3 format. Um, the MP3 format, uh, if you guys uh, are familiar with sound compression, um, the MP3 format takes a sound that's represented in some broad form and it compresses that representation to something that sounds similar to us or maybe indistinguishable to us. Um, and the idea is that MP3 is basically a collection, it's a codification of what we can hear. Uh, the way MP3 works is it uh, uses um, very short segments of audio, something like 16 milliseconds. So every MP3 is made up of 16 millisecond frames. Um, but you don't hear that because they kind of fade into each other. Um, so the people that made MP3 believe that all of the sounds that we can dis distinguish can be encoded into those 16 millisecond frames. So um, I got so I'm kind of amazed and, and interested by this that I, in a way, I kind of gave up my original question of how many sounds can we distinguish, and I started looking at how many sounds are we uh, kind of conditioned to distinguish, um, and I computed it, <laughs> and it turns out that it's something like 10 to the 450 years worth of sounds if you, if you lay them all back to back. That's what MP3 says. It says that's how many sounds we can distinguish. It's a lot of sounds. Um, and so I wanted to kind of organize those in some way that you had a feeling of the monstrosity of this space. And that's what the composition is. It's a, it's a 10 to the 450 year long composition uh, that organizes all of these sounds. Um, and I'll actually play a very, very short excerpt of that. <laughs> um, what, what fraction of the entire thing would be playing? Um, <laughs> about 10, 10 to the negative 450. <laughs> um, so it's actually streaming right now if you guys want to listen to a small portion of it. Um, oh, we're loud. It's louder now. It's, it's streaming right now. We're basically about a month and a, two days into the composition. The first month was streamed as part of my master's thesis from uh, RPI, and then the last two days have been streamed as part of Glitch Festival, which is happening in Chicago right now. Um,
often turns out that I don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> so I've, I've played it for people before where I'm like, oh, this is so quiet, I can't hear it. And then like the next sound is so loud that everyone's like, ah. So <laughs> there's a little bit of variation right now, but it's actually not. <laughs> OK, it's pretty bad. Never mind. <laughs> So I'm going to put that on pause. Um, yeah, so half of this, half of this uh, project was basically figuring out how the MP3 format works and kind of reverse engineering it to do what I wanted it to do. Um, and the other half of the project was uh, organizing those sounds. So once I understood how MP3 worked and I could use MP3 to synthesize sounds, um, I had to figure out how to organize them. Uh, now, if, if, who knows how to like count in binary? Yeah, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, right. Uh, that's one really a easy way that you could kind of enumerate all of these possible bit strings, these MP3 frames, um, is by counting in binary. Uh, but it turns out if you do that, uh, you don't really ever hear any variation, just because the way that MP3 is, uh, the bit string is formatted. What you would hear is basically uh, a really low tone that kind of fluctuates and warbles for a few millennia, and then you'd hear a slightly higher low tone <laughs> that fluctuates some more. Um, and I quickly realized that was not a good way to organize these sounds, and I had to figure out another way. Um, and so what I did is I started collecting operators, basically. Operators that did what's called a one-to-one -one mapping between numbers. So let's say I have all the numbers from 1 to 100. Um, if I take those numbers and I reverse the digits, so now 1 becomes 100 zero, zero, and 100 becomes 001 zero, zero, and 50, uh, I guess 50 becomes 5. Maybe you have to have them all the same length. So I have numbers between 100 and 999. And then 999 becomes 999, 888 is 888, but 899 is 998. Anyway, so that's one operation where all of the numbers go to another number uniquely. Like no two numbers map to the same number and no single number could possibly map to multiple numbers. Um, so I started collecting operations like this where it was always a one-to-one -one mapping. And what I did is I stacked them up on top of binary enumeration. Um, so I counted in binary and then I would take the current binary number and put it through a bunch of these operators. Um, and I experimented with a lot of these different combinations until I found something that organized the sounds in a way where I could hear variation and it was an interesting variation. Uh, it's still really difficult to compose that way because it's not in any way similar to like saying, oh, I want to have a 7-4 rhythm here, <laughs> or I want to have, uh, you know, bridge. a third, yeah, bridge, breakdown. <laughs> it doesn't really work that way. You kind of have to craft the whole 10 to the 450 years at the same time, simultaneously, um, and try and optimize for, you know, both the beginning, the end, and the whole middle part. Um, <laughs> The way that I knew when I was done actually was, um, uh, yeah, so like this is some of the, my experiments trying to figure out some operators that do that mapping. Um, uh, this is kind of what the mapping actually looks like. Along the top you can see numbers in binary, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, it's from left to right instead. And then the operation that I'm doing to kind of transform it to some final value. You can see that 1 ends up getting mapped back to 1, but all these other numbers get mapped to crazy things that are not really related to each other. Um, whoa. Did you hear that? Interference between the audio and the video channels. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, I wonder what, hold on, hold on one second. What if, if I zoom in slightly? <laughs> New performance interface. All right. <laughs> see, this is, how, this is what I do. <laughs> Uh, th there's the explanation, there's the lecture for you right there. Um, <laughs> yeah, the way I knew I was done basically is I, I went, um, I was trying to synthesize a bunch of different parts of it, and uh, let me go to hey, the Kyle? Google code. Yeah. We're going over 10 minutes now. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, I'm going to go about 30 more seconds. I, I synthesized some different portions of it. First I synthesized the beginning. Oh, it's a huge download, I can't do that. I synthesized the beginning, and I thought, okay, this sounds kind of nice, this is calm. And then I went to the middle. This is like 4 a.m. the day before my thesis is due. I went to the middle, and I was like, oh, okay, this sounds kind of similar. And then it broke into one of those crazy parts where it's like, go! 
and I got so scared that I took my headphones off and I went to sleep and had nightmares and then I was then I knew I was done <laughs> and yeah so thanks for coming to the lecture and uh, I'd love to hear any questions that you